So, good morning. My name is Tim Hucker, and I've been tasked with talking about phantom pain. Um, any talk about phantom pain is predominantly uh, the discussion of phantom limb pain. However, we should, from the very outset, be thinking in terms of post-amputation pain and all the post-amputation syndromes, ranging from the bizarre dysesthesias to stump pain, which can be nociceptive or neuropathic in character, all the way through to the what we would all recognise as phantom limb pain. So the plan of my talk is, as normal, to go through an introduction, a bit of a history, and some of the the forefathers of of this particular science, and the clinical features, and the mechanisms. In particular, when we talk about the mechanisms, we'll discuss the, in brief, the neurobiology. Um, of persistent pain development. However, we won't go through this in detail and it'll be covered in other parts of this course. And finally, a word or two on prevention. So, this gentleman is the impressively bearded Ambrose Paré. Um, he's a French military surgeon from the 16th century and was probably the first describer of, of uh, phantom pain. And not uh, till at least 200 years or so later in the American Civil War um, was phantom limb pain accurately described. And this was described by this uh, gentleman, Silas Mitchell. Um, he was a surgeon at the time of the American Civil War um, and is famous for his uh, description of C or the, the start of the description of CRPS and at the same time reported on phantom limb pain. Like any topic, it always starts with a definition, and the simple definition is that phantom pain is pain perceived, perceived in a region of the body that no longer exists. When we're talking about phantom pain, we usually talk about phantom limb pain. Now, at the beginning I discussed, I mentioned um, post-amputation syndromes. And phantom pain can occur in any organ or uh, or part of the or region of the body that has been amputated. So we shouldn't just think about phantom limb. Um, examples of case reports include uh, phantom pain after eye enucleation, tongue removal, and dental extraction. One of the other parts that's uh, commonly described is. Um, post mastectomy syndrome and a or a phantom breast syndrome and this is a common situation um, it's experienced in terms of phantom sensation um, between about 20 and 40 percent of patients post mastectomy um, and about 15 percent report uh, report pain <coughs> excuse me and this is usually pain that is localized to the nipple and spreads over the whole breast during the course of year one post mastectomy it's common and frequently distressing. However, we usually just discuss phantom limb pain and we'll, we'll use these phrases interchangeably. So what is the instance or of this condition? Well, phantom sensation occurs in virtually everyone um, who's had an amputation. Um, some say 98%, but really I would suggest that most people, that everyone does get some form of sensation. Phantom limb pain occurs in about 60 to 80 percent and we've defined that as you can see and stump pain in at least 50 percent of the population of the amputee population. Now this represents a significant disease burden. Um, a recent paper from America reported the instance of amputation as there being 1.5 million amputees in the US alone. This is a massive, massive population in terms of the pain population. So when does phantom pain occur? It usually occurs in the first uh, week or two post the amputation and that's reported about 75% 75, 75 of this population. Some people do report it as occurring later um, and there are some very unusual case reports of people describing it starting years or so um, later. Um, there are some case reports even of pe people having spinal or epidural anaesthetics and 
some years after after an amputation and when that happens it uh, they then experience a phantom pain whether there's some degree of uh, sensory block unmasking an existing phantom pain who knows but it's um like many features of this of these clinical syndromes they're bizarre uh, clinical pictures frequently so what are the risk factors for developing phantom limb pain in to my mind the uh, phantom limb pain is the sort of extreme end of the persistent post-surgical pain spectrum now unlike the work of Kellett, Kellett and others who've looked into the predisposing factors for persistent post-surgical pain they haven't been quite as well elucidated in this population and whether that's just a reflection of the heterogeneous nature of these syndromes uh, it's difficult to know when you look through this list um, this is probably what's commonly accepted as a list of the risk factors for developing phantom limb pain however there's evidence to and and contrary to to almost all of these however this is probably the accepted accepted list preamputation pain is common particularly in the uh, vasculopathic patients patients with renal failure diabetes etc it certainly seems to be more prevalent in people having bilateral amputations traumatic amputations and it appears to be more common in upper extremity versus lower extremity um, it, aff it affects older people um, and children ha certainly have a, de a considerable degree uh, less phantom limb pain and those with congenital limb loss virtually nil um, because more commonly in women too um, we'll go on and talk about stump condition and stump pains and other uh, predisposing factors to developing phantom limb pain um, it's worth considering that a lot of this population are people living with um, chronic illness um, or people who've suffered this amputation either as a result of trauma or war or uh, torture and there will be a significant degree of distress and psychological dysfunction in this in this population so what are the clinical features of phantom pain so <clears throat> classically patients describe an intermittent or almost paroxysmal pain um, with almost any of the descriptive features of nociceptive or neuropathic pain from allodynia, hyperalgesia, burning etc. Name a, name a pain clinical feature and these patients will have reported it phantom sensations as we've discussed earlier are in virtually everyone and they tend to be categorized into three different categories kinetic, kinesthetic and extraceptive kinetic is sensation related to the feeling of of the amputated part being moved kinesthetic relates to its position and extraceptive means the external an external feature applied to that to that phantom for instance there's a lot of work done in amputees after war in the Middle East and a lot of these patients describe these very unusual sensations of for instance having wearing some boots and the, the, sh the boots are done up too tightly so it's an external feature um, and the limb can be felt or the phantom can be felt in um, any number of different ways um, and any number of different positions or activities and again uh, another <clears throat> bizarre clinical feature is that of telescoping um, and telescoping occurs particularly in the upper limb and this is a truly bizarre sensation where um, after time or time after amputation the patient reports that the hand for instance well, it seems it appears to sort of move more proximally so for instance if they've had a above elbow amputation over the course of time the patient will start experiencing the phantom hand to be attached to the stump above the elbow so it sort of moves in a proximal direction all these uh, clinical features are interchangeable because phantom sensation and phantom pain are connected 
and patients who have phantom sensation will, will often go on to develop phantom pain. Now, stump pain is common, um, and stump pain, like phantom sensation, is linked to the development of phantom limb pain. Now, stump pain, again, can be described in any of the clinical features of nociceptive or neuropathic pain. Um, and it seems to have a much more localised uh, cause. In examination of the stump, um, there may be clinical features of bone spur, infection or neuroma, and no examination of the stump is complete without looking at the prosthesis, if there is one, and how it's attached and its effect on the stump itself. There's been some evidence recently that um, trigger points, whether they're neuromas, it's difficult to know, but trigger points of phantom pain found in the stump um, can actually be treated and reduce the incidence of phantom pain. So stump pain and phantom pain and phantom sensation and phantom pain are most definitely interconnected. So what is the neurobiology of, of phantom pain? Phantom pain with all its different clinical features appears to encompass the whole of the known devel developmental factors for persistent pain and when thinking about it one should work from the periphery up to the very highest centres and there's clinical evidence for changes occurring at all these levels from the periphery to the spinal cord and higher. This unfortunate gentleman is the uh, first reported survivor of a triple amputation and it would seem extremely likely this man would in those days uh, have experienced a neuroma and this is the histology of a neuroma and this will occur peripherally in the significant percentage of patients having an amputation. At the periphery the development of neuroma is, is perhaps one of the reasons for the clinical features of paroxysms of pain. Neuromas have hyperexcitability, uh, ectopic discharge and abnormal iron channel features uh, leading to a lower threshold potential and a significant chance of depolarization without the normal limit limitations. Moving from the periphery up to the spinal cord, the <clears throat> process of central sensitization is no doubt is no doubt abundant in this in this population. Um, after nerve dissection, there is a reduction or almost atrophy of unmyelinated C fibers. As a result, the A beta fibers seem to grow from the more uh, the deeper parts of the of the rexed laminae in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, and they cause these this sprouting up into the more superficial layers. And what happens there is that any form of A beta fiber stimulation will lead to depolarization in the second order neuron, signaling nociception and a patient will experience pain after light touch only. All the other mechanisms of central sensitization and wind up are featured in this group and I'm sure in other parts of this course the, these will be discussed in greater detail. Moving on to the higher levels this is a schematic of, of the homunculus and cortical re reorganization appears to occur commonly and fairly rapidly in this population and it's been well demonstrated in magnetoencephalography studies. What appears to happen here is that an area of somatosensory cortex that is adjacent to the area of somatosensory cortex that corresponds to the missing part appears to almost infiltrate that region. So what I mean by that is the, the mouth and the hand, for instance, are very close together on this, on this uh, part of the somatosensory cortex. 
And what's common is that patients who are who have upper limb amputations will actually experience the sensation of touch to the amputated digits when the face is actually stroked. So this occurs at a cortical level. Moving even higher up, there are m multiple and quite complex theories of um, cort of sort of higher centre uh, pain processing, in particular in this group. Um, one of the most reported is that of Melzack, who describes the neuromatrix and the neurosignature, and these are thought to be the components of the neuromatrix. Quite a complex theory and worth worth having a read. And if you look at the evidence reported in the the evidence listed in the revision notes associated with this topic, some of the papers will go into these different theories and interesting theories in quite a significant amount of detail. So Melzack reports a neuromatrix of the body self uh, with multiple inputs and a neurosignature made up of activity pa patterns constantly updated and based on awareness and perception. And the neurosignature appears to be the out output of the neuromatrix. When deafferentation occurs, <clears throat> there appears to be deprived inputs to the neuromatrix and then a development of an abnormal neurosignature. Um, this is Melzack theory and there, there is some more recent adaptation to these theories. Again, worth, worth a read. And finally, I suppose at the highest possible centres, um, Sigmund Freud reports a, a phantom limb pain being part of a mourning process for, for the loss of that body part. <clears throat> so, moving on to management, and this is where the, the bad news starts, in that, unfortunately, no one therapy seems to be better than another. And there's a very large amount of evidence, mainly in the form of case reports, um, looking at different modalities of therapy. Unfortunately, nothing appears to be the clear winner. And again, maybe that reflects just the heterogene heterogeneous nature of these, of these syndromes. So what is our approach to the management of this group of patients? Like all patients, we approach them in terms of history examination and investigation and exclusion of a differential diagnosis. In this case, examples of this would include metastasis or herpes zoster. All patients with stump pain should have a surgical review. This would be mandatory and in some cases a remodelling of the stump will remove the cause of the phantom limb pain. And as we all subscribe to a multimodal, multidisciplinary approach, the the expertise of, of psychologists, physiotherapists, and extremely importantly, the prosthetic specialists, as a prosthesis itself may be a cause of stump pain, and stump pain, as we know, may be a cause of phantom pain. With regard to the psychological aspects, a lot of these patients have been living with chronic illness for many years, have other associated clinical illnesses, or this may have occurred through a distressing and traumatic event um, and there's no doubt that an amputation is extremely psychologically disturbing. With regard to a medical, the medical side of things, as I've mentioned, this needs to have a multimodal approach and there's certainly a case, we think, for a all amputations to be reviewed by a pain specialist. Um, Amputations, most of us would believe, need to be treated aggressively and early, and using a rapid change from one modality to another and combinations, and relying on the expertise of the pain specialist to get this patient under control as soon as possible. Intractable phantom pain is extremely difficult to manage. Thinking about modalities, they're they are, as usual, divided into physical, psychological and pharmaceutical. And as you can see by this extensive list, there is an enormous number of things that have been tried and unfortunately no clear 
winner. There appears to be some evidence, interestingly, recently for tens, and uh, this appears to be beneficial in certainly a group of patients. As I say, this ranges from the simple pharmaceutical to the very complex physical spinal procedure. So the Cochrane database is a very useful source of evidence for us, and this was published in the last year or so, and unfortunately makes pretty gloomy reading for those of us involved in the management of patients with phantom pain. So all of these listed above are unclear. There is some short-term benefit, it seems, from morphine, gabapentin, and ketamine, and unfortunately no clear benefit from amitriptyline. So the pharmaceutical field, most people would report case reports of benefit from any one of these particular uh, drugs or, or groups of drugs. But most people would probably suggest that you start one and move very rapidly on to another if there's no significant benefit. Of the more physical types, um, it's worth considering mirror therapy and this is a mirror placed vertically in a box without a lid and the in the case of a upper limb amputation the uh, normal limb is placed on one side and the other limb is appears to be inserted in the other side <coughs> and the patient looks almost sort of parasagittally so alongside and looks into the mirror and then guided by the therapist will uh, try and accomplish a series of tasks. Um, this appears to be most beneficial for some of the more unusual sensation as so sensations associated with phantom pain. Um, commonly in the upper limb patients report a sort of clenching of the fist and a the visual the visual feedback provided by the normal limb which now appears to be the amputated limb unclenching appears to be therapeutic even more simply than that is the concept of imagery and there is some evidence that just asking a patient to imagine the presence of the amputated part and sensation in the amputated part will reduce the amount of phantom pain that these patients experience. So finally we should talk about prevention of this condition. And prevention obviously starts at an organisational and governmental level with encouragement for lifestyle modification and prevention of the vasculopathic conditions that are commonly associated with phantom pain. Um, other features, other things they could do would include road safety and Actually, war and battlefield amputations needs addressing. The main area of prevention that has been discussed at great length in the literature is that of preemptive analgesia. And we'll go on and talk about the difference between preemptive and preventative analgesia in just a minute. But there is case report evidence only for the use of preemptive analgesia in a planned surgical amputation by the use of an epidural anaesthetic. So does that, ex does that exclude the possibility of preventive analgesia? And probably the experts in the field, people like Kellett, um, etc., would not or appear to me to uh, encourage uh, certainly more evidence and the use of uh, dense regional anaesthetic techniques at the time of surgery and uh, around the whole perioperative period. Excuse me. And to my mind, this will this will become a common part of practice in the in the coming years. But we'll have to wait and see for the evidence, obviously. So preemptive analgesia is the concept of providing an analgesic technique prior to a surgical insult. And that's the only timing related. Now, there's some benefit to preemptive analgesia. Uh, examples would include the use of um, some of the gabapentinoids prior to surgery. But 
I believe that preemptive analgesia is a flawed concept because it assumes that the nociceptive barrage or the insult only occurs at the time of surgery or at the time of injury or accident. Now, we know from other groups of, of patients with neuropathic pain, for example, the cytic nerve injury patients who patients who suffered pelvic injury, that the cause of the sciatic nerve injury can occur at the time of the accident, at the time of surgery, and in the post-operative period. So it seems impossible that we can define a short period of nociception will lead to uh, the development of persistent post-surgical pain. So preventive analgesia, I believe, is a better concept because it quite simply assumes that the insult can occur at any time in the, in the if we're talking about surgical amputation, in the perioperative period, and is a much broader and, to my mind, more sensible approach to the analgesia. To analgesia. And prevention, as we know, is, is always better than cure. So hopefully it would appear that preventive analgesic strategies will improve the management of phantom pain in this very difficult group of patients. The, area, the other area of prevention that needs a close uh, investigation is that of the surgical technique at the time of insult. Um, and certainly studies in Denmark have looked at the difference between ligation or uh, blunt dissection versus sharp nerve dissection. And it would appear that this will be an important change in surgical technique as the early evidence shows that sharp nerve dissection is associated with significantly less post-operative neuropathic pain. So just to end on a couple of very, very brief points. Phantom pain should be considered as part of the gamut of post-amputation -amput syndromes ranging from dysesthesia and there are some of the bizarre features associated with those dysesthesias all the way through to phantom pain itself. It's common, it has a number of predisposing factors and it is at the moment under research. That Cochrane publication I mentioned earlier had a look at 583 publications which only 13 uh, got into their, met their criteria. It's difficult to treat, there is no clear therapeutic winner and finally it's poorly treated at the moment. A study in 2006 showed that 53% of patients who reported phantom limb pain received no therapy whatsoever. Bear in mind that phantom limb pain is often associated with reports of severe pain. This is quite a worrying statistic. Thank you very much.